Hello class. Today we're going to work on chapter 28. It's a relatively short chapter and basically explains unemployment and how we measure the unemployment rate. So we're going to see how is unemployment measured, what is the natural rate of unemployment, and why are there always some people unemployed. We're going to look at a little bit how unemployment is affected by unions and minimum wage. And we're going to see the idea about the theory of efficiency wages. So every month, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which is run by the U.S. Department of Labor, sends out a survey. And it surveys about 60,000 households in the U.S. And what they do is that they basically ask in that survey, I mean, to anyone who's above the age of 16 or older, whether they're working or if they're not working, what are they doing? Are they looking for a job or are they not looking for a job? So after the survey comes in, and this is done every month, the BLS divides the population into three groups. The first group is employed. These are people who are either they're working, they're paid employees, or they're self-employed, or they are unpaid workers in a family business. The second group is unemployed workers, people who are not working, but they have been looking for a job for the past four weeks. So this is an important number, four weeks. That's the cutoff point. If someone looked for a job six weeks ago, then that person is not considered unemployed. But if someone is looking for a job for the past four weeks, then they're considered to be unemployed. And everyone else is considered, if you're not employed or not unemployed, then you're part of, you're not in the labor force. So the labor force in the US is the total number of workers which is the sum of employed and unemployed workers. So the unemployment rate is calculated in the following way. It's the percentage of the labor force that is unemployed. So that's the formula for unemployment rate. And the labor force participation rate is the percentage of adults that are in the labor force. So out of the total number of adults in the labor force, or of total number of adults in the US, how many are in the labor force? So let's look at um, an example. So let's say this is um, the information we have. The number of employed people in the US is 144.3 million. The number of unemployed is 11.3 million. And the rest of the people not in the labor force is 90.6 million. So not in the labor force, this includes people who are full-time students, who are not working, or who are above the age of 65 and they retired stay-at-home moms, stay-at-home dads, all those people are not considered to be part of the labor force. So now, if we wanted to compute the labor force, unemployment rate, adult population, and labor force participation rate using this data. So the labor force is the total number of people employed plus total number of people unemployed, which is 155.6 million. The unemployment rate is out of the proportion of people in the labor force, what what is the percentage of people who are currently not working and are looking for a job? So it's 11.3 million out of this 155.6 million, so it's about 70.3%. The total population of adults is the total number of people in the labor force and the total number of people not in the labor force, which is 246 million. And so the labor force participation rate is the proportion of adults who are either working or are looking for a job. And so from this number, we find that it's about 63%. So out of the total number of adults in the US, 63% of the adults either work or are looking for a job. So if we look at the BLS, not only does look at um, total labor force statistics, they actually disaggregate it by different groups, by states, by cities. So you can have a an understanding of what groups have different levels of unemployment rate or different levels of um, labor force participation. And these data reveal very different labor market experiences for different groups. So if we look at adults who are 20 years and older, if we look at a white male, the unemployment rate is 6.1%, labor force participation rate is 72%. Okay, for let's say for an African American female, the unemployment rate is 10% and the labor force participation rate is 61%. If we look at teens, 
people between the age of 16 and 19, the unemployment rate is much higher. And the labor force participation rate is also much lower because most teens in that age group are full-time students. If you look at um, people from other ethnic groups, Asians have an uh, unemployment rate of 5.3%, whereas Hispanics have an unemployment rate of 9%. If you look at by education, you see people with less than high school degree have a high unemployment rate. People with a bachelor's degree or more have a very low unemployment rate. And if we look at labor force participation rate, of course, it increases as people have more degrees or have more education. This is how labor force participation rate has changed over time. For women, it has increased to, from 1960s till about 1995, and then it's kind of stabilized, and we have been seeing that it's falling over time. Same thing we see with males. Males have also, labor force participation rate has been falling over time. So less people as a proportion are given for what are actually working or are looking for a job. What does unemployment rate actually measure? I mean, it's not a perfect indicator of joblessness because it excludes discouraged workers. If a worker has been looking for a job for weeks and weeks and weeks and finally gave up, it doesn't, the unemployment rate does not measure those people because they are considered to be out of the labor force. It doesn't distinguish between full-time and part-time jobs. So it doesn't distinguish between the quality of jobs that people have. So you might have people who are working part-time because they can't get a full-time job because it's unavailable. Unemployment rate does not measure that. It just measures whether you're employed or unemployed. Sometimes people misreport their work status. But even after all those issues, the unemployment rate is still a very important barometer to measure the labor market. It becomes a very important issue during elections if unemployment rate is very high, then politicians make it a big issue that, look, this is not how the economy should not be run. Uh, what's the duration? Most unemployment spells are short. Typically, one third of the people are unemployed for under five weeks, two thirds are on, on the unemployed for under 14 weeks. So if you lose, if 100 people lose their job today, 33 of them will get a job within five weeks, and about 67 of them will get a job within 14 weeks, which is about three and a half months. About 20 of them will be unemployed for over six months. Yet most observed unemployment is long run. This is the group of people who have very little turnover. So these are the people whom we see as unemployed for most periods of time. And so identifying who is long-term unemployed and why they are long-term unemployed can help policymakers design policies that can help those people who are unemployed for long periods of time. Now, there, are, there is always some unemployment because there are, and the reason is because of what we call frictional unemployment, and we're going to see that. The natural rate of unemployment is basically the rate at which the economy performs the best. So even if the economy is growing at tremendous speed, there is the economy is wealthy, there is still some degree of unemployment, and that's called the natural rate of unemployment. Cyclical unemployment is any deviation from the natural rate of unemployment. And this is associated with business cycles, and we'll try to cover a little bit in chapters 30. If not, then you can learn it if, if you want to take more econ courses. So if we look at this, this is how the kind of US unemployment rate looks like over time. There are periods when it was very high. That's the natural rate. So basically, let's say in 1980, uh, let's look at a pointer. The natural unemployment rate is supposed to be around 7%, so the economy would have been great, performing uh, very strong if the natural rate of unemployment has been around 7%. But it, the observed unemployment was around 10.5% or 11%. So this deviation, this is known as cyclical unemployment. So any deviation from the natural rate is called cyclical unemployment. Now, why, is, uh, why do we see that the economy is, uh, still has some unemployment even when there is um, 
like if the economy is doing really well. And the reason is because of what we call frictional unemployment. This happens when workers spend time searching for the job that best suits their skills and taste. So for example, let's say you're a senior in college right now and then you want to graduate and uh, in May, but um, you're not taking any jobs. You apply to a lot of jobs, you got an offer, but it's not the one that you want. So you're waiting and you want to wait and see if you get the job that you really want. So you know, in effect, you are unemployed, you're looking for a job, but you're confident that you'll get a better job. And this is short term for most worker. The other kind is structural. This is when there are fewer jobs than workers. So there's fewer jobs to go around and there are more workers. And this is usually longer term. And this is when people don't have maybe the right set, set of skills in the job market. So workers have different tastes and skills, and sometimes jobs have different requirements. And so job search is a way of ma matching workers with appropriate jobs. And uh, there are sex uh, things that we call sectoral shifts, which ca causes changes in the composition of the economy. So for example, North Carolina was a big clothing manufacturer back in the day, but then because of changes in the economy, that industry no longer exists in North Carolina. So a lot of people who were working in those industry, in that industry, became unemployed. So the economy, that kind of shifts, they displace workers, and now they must search for new jobs that fits their skills and tastes. And so the economy is always changing, so frictional unemployment is always there, and so you must do certain things to keep yourself, probably train or acquire new skill sets so that you get jobs. And so there's always going to be some frictional unemployment because of that. You're, the industry where you're working may disappear, and so you must find another job somewhere else. How does government help reduce unemployment rate? Well, there are government employment agencies that provide information to job vacancies, and they help to match workers with jobs. There are public training programs that aim to equip workers from declining industries to um, other industries where um, there is a need for people. And there's unemployment insurance, which is a program that provides some uh, money. If someone loses their jobs, then unemployment insurance provides some income to workers when they become unemployed for a specific number of time, usually around 26 weeks. Unemployment insurance does increase frictional unemployment in a way because unemployment insurance ends when a worker takes a job. So if a worker just lost their job, they may not search for a job right away. They might wait for, let's say, up till the week 20. They're getting some income. It's not their full income, but about 60% of their, it could be at most 60% of their um, wages. So why would you lose that uh, opportunity? So what they do, what a lot of workers, not all of them, but of some workers, they might have less incentive to search really hard to find a job until when the deadline approaches of them losing their unemployment insurance. So that's when they're like, okay, now I got to find a job. And now I got to make sure that, you know, because I'm going to run out of this money soon, so I must look for a job now. The benefits are it reduces uncertainty over income. So if you lose your income or if you lose your job, you don't become, you don't fall into poverty right away. It gives people more time to search for a job that better suits their taste and their skills. But it also may be misused by some people. They might just wait until the last minute to find a job and get the benefits of unemployment insurance. Now there's another kind of uh, called structural unemployment. Structural unemployment happens if this is the demand for labor workers, that's the supply of workers, if that's the wage. It normally happens if there's not enough jobs to go around. And this normally happens when the wage is kept above equilibrium. So even though the equilibrium wage is WE, for some reason, wage is actually kept at W1. So we have some degree of unemployment like that.
So there is more workers who are willing to work and less workers, uh, less demand for workers. And so there is unemployment there. So there are three reasons for this. One is minimum wage, and we talked about this in chapter six. Minimum wage may keep some workers from not working because uh, there is not enough demand for their worker or work. But this group is small part of the labor force. It's not, it's, uh, yes, it is important to the people who work at minimum wage, but as part of the whole labor force, the proportion of people who work at minimum wage is relatively small, so it can't explain most unemployment. Unions do uh, affect it. Uh, union is a worker association that bargains with employers over wages, benefits, and working conditions. So unions also exert market power and negotiate wages on behalf of workers. And it is usually a typical union worker earns about 20% higher wages than a non-union worker. So because of bargaining, because unions bring workers together and they work together, if one worker goes up to the firm and says, I want more wages, then the firm might say, no, you, I can't pay you more. If you don't like it, you can leave. But if all the workers band together and go to the firm uh, and or the owner and say, we want higher wages, the firm cannot fire all of them because recruiting can recruiting all those workers for, like it can take a long time. It can be a very really costly process. So firms might ask for okay, well, all right, we're going to pay you more. Just stay. So it can have it can raise wages of union workers, and that can have an effect on non-union worker in finding unemployment because even if I want to uh, work in that industry, if it's unionized, then I can't because I, I'm not, uh, because the demand for my work is less or there is no demand for my work. The third is efficiency wages, which is basically firms pay higher wages to workers to boost their productivity. There are different versions why, I mean, this happens. Why would a firm actually want to pay more? Well, the reason is one is worker health. If you're paid more, you tend to eat better quality food, so your health gets better. Worker turnover decreases because if you're already paid a high amount, why would you want to leave? You want to stay in this, um, in that, uh, with that employer as long as possible. Worker quality is higher. If I get paid more, I get to work more. I'm more productive because I don't want to lose this job. And work effort, the worker effort is also more because, you know, I, since I don't want to lose the job, I am going to work as hard as possible to make sure that the boss knows that I'm working hard. So these are some theories why wages are kept above equilibrium wage, and that's why we see some degree of structural unemployment. All right, so that's all we have for our unemployment chapter.